I've always thought of Last Bible as one of the darkest corners of the Megami Tensei franchise. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if many of you had no idea what it was. The series is no small part of Mega Ten history, spanning multiple genres across a variety of platforms, and yet despite that, it is exceedingly unpopular. I can probably count the amount of times I've seen someone identify themselves as a Last Bible fan on one hand. As the audience for Megami Tensei grows wider by the day, and fans find themselves discussing even its most inaccessible titles, Last Bible has consistently fallen to the wayside, even with one of its games officially released in the United States, and the rest having full fan translations. So what's the deal with these games getting the cold shoulder? Do they suck that much ass? I mean, come on, even the name sounds like a bootleg version of Final Fantasy. Last Bible? The hell was wrong with the first one? At a glance, you wouldn't be mistaken for thinking that some of them look like a game your grandma would pick up for you for like $10 at Walgreens. Megami Tensei is known for its largely modern world to tackle ideological problems and mature themes. The only problem the last Bible series looks like it's ready to tackle is how quickly it'll make me fall asleep. Sure, the basic DNA of the franchise is still here. Demon negotiation, turn-based combat, duels with powerful gods. But the presentation is about as generic as it could be, and the mechanics and storylines look simplified, to put it lightly. To me, that sounds like a death sentence that strips away everything that makes the franchise unique. But look at all this shit. There must be something here that kept people coming back, but what? Well, that's exactly what we're going to try and find out. In this video, we'll be starting our journey through each and every game in the last Bible series to find out what, if anything, makes them worth checking out in the present. In this episode, we'll check out the first two entries in the numbered trilogy. In the next one, we'll cover two additional games, a strategy game and a dungeon crawler, that are standalone titles disconnected from the others. Finally, the last episode will be devoted to Last Bible 3, the climax of the series which also happens to be the longest. As a bonus, I'm going to throw in some coverage of the incredibly obscure Last Bible New Testament games, and the potential future they hold for the series. As always, I'll be discussing the plot, mechanics, and general flow of each title. Heavy spoilers are going to emerge as we progress deeper. Consider using these videos to preview the opening chapters or gameplay of a particular entry you're interested in, or feel free to join me all the way through to the end if you're so inclined. My intention here is to provide an easily accessible resource for the entire series. Feel free to use it as you see fit. We've got a long road in front of us, so let's get to it and see what we can dig up. The one that started it all was Megami Tensei Gaiden Last Bible, a top-down fantasy RPG that follows the story of a group of young apprentices training to become Gaia Masters. Naturally, their day-to-day -day routines are suddenly interrupted by the arrival of demons. From there, it's up to you to explore the world, conquer dungeons, and build up an army of all kinds of horrific creatures to help you along. When it comes to ports and re-releases, Last Bible has more than you might think, and the differences between them can be a little confusing. It was originally released in Japan in 1992 for the Game Boy, featuring both a single-player main quest and a multiplayer battle mode. Yeah, that's right. If you could get two people with copies of this game in the same room, and you had a Game Boy Link cable, you could pit your parties against one another. That's pretty sick, but I think having two Last Bible fans within 50 feet of each other is outlawed in most countries. In 1994, Last Bible received an upgraded re-release on the Sega Game Gear, which unfortunately dropped the multiplayer mode, but added on improved graphics, sound, and more story content. A worthy trade-off if you ask me. Interestingly enough, in 1998, the game was ported to the Game Boy Color, with graphics nearly identical to the original, except for, well, more color, and none of the Game Gear content. However, perhaps as a consolation prize, the battle mode came back. This version would make it to the United States in 1999, and is the only Last Bible title ever to do so. If you don't remember hearing about this one, that might be because it was published with a completely different name, Revelations the Demon Slayer. Kinda like Revelations Persona. Honestly, the Game Boy Color version gets weirder the more you think about it. It came out years after a visually superior release of the game with more content already existed. You'd think in that span of time they could have at least squeezed in the extra story bits if the graphics were a no-go. I imagine this version came to be as an easy way to scoop up some of the hype generated by a little something called Pokemon, or maybe as a drop in the bucket for people bored of the latest Square RPGs. 
The Game Boy was way more popular than the Game Gear in the West as well, so it made the platform a natural choice for bringing the series to an international market. But it's regrettable that the only last Bible game we ever got was in essence a low effort cash grab. Now believe it or not, the ports don't stop here. The Game Boy Color version also got a Japan exclusive release on the 3DS eShop in 2012. And in 2020, the Game Gear version made its triumphant return on the Game Gear Micro. This stupidly tiny gimmick handheld that boasts a screen width of 1.15 inches. If you ever wanted to enjoy some classic Atlas gaming on a screen the size of the average Mega 10 fan's penis, well, the opportunity's out there. I know what you're thinking. Holy shit, Marshall, we get it. This game was printed more times than the actual Bible. But if you're gonna play it once, it's good to know what options are on the table. And my personal suggestion is to do it on the 1994 Game Gear release. It looks good, it sounds good, and it's got a beefed up story that greatly enhances the game's final chapters, leading directly into the sequel. Thanks to the wonders of the internet and the work of many dedicated fans all over the world, it's also easily playable today in English. Let's check it out. So the first thing you see before you even hit the main menu is a pretty nice looking intro that gives us context for the universe we're about to delve into. In the early years on the fifth planet from the sun, beings that resembled humans arrived with an ancient, life-giving substance called orichalcum. Possessing supernatural power known as Gaia, the beings used the orichalcum to cultivate the planet. Uh, yeah, that's it. Some real ancient aliens type shit. Click through the main menu, start a new game, and we have a good old-fashioned text crawl to keep the ball rolling. Presumably many thousands of years later, the people who sprung up from the seeds planted by the ancients hold a yearly ritual in which every 14-year-old child is brought to a place called Mount Paulo, where some are then chosen to become Gaia Masters. Our view switches right to the mountain as a sagely looking dude prepares to make his choices. He orders those who feel the power of Gaia within to state their names, and it's time to get started with our main characters. These guys have canon names, but considering the entry screen is blank, I'm just gonna make up my own as usual. Naturally, I named the protagonist after myself. For our male ally, I decided to give nut grabbing Charlie a break and go with Akira. Original, I know. I spent about 12 hours trying to think of a cool name for the female partner, but ultimately settled on Rei, the old standby. Another exciting text crawl explains that as the three began their Gaia training, the old masters gradually began to disappear, and the world was heading down a dark path. Not exactly the best plot I've ever heard, but hang on for a bit. There are some pretty interesting turns to the story, and the final act is actually quite remarkable. So we get plopped on our ass in the town of Moira in front of our teacher Zodia. He reminisces over the past two years we've spent training with him, and urges us to head to the temple and receive an official proclamation of our new status as a Gaia Paragon, yet another step on the way to becoming a fully fledged master. The priest is all hyped up to give us our rank, but also demands that we pledge eternal allegiance to God. It just wouldn't be Megami Tensei game without that happening within the first five seconds of playing. After making things official, we get a cheap sword, some fur armor, and a hundred bucks. Really? Fur armor? What do I look like, a fucking caveman? Let's see if the shops have anything better than this. So much for two years of my life. Outside, some guy lets us know that while Zodia is knowledgeable, he doesn't really measure up to the likes of Lucifer or Michael, who are the Gaia masters that recently vanished. Well no shit, that's like saying your McDonald's manager isn't quite as iconic as Jesus Christ. What do you expect? So anyway, Moira is a pretty small town. You got a handful of houses and a row of shops along the top. From left to right, we've got items, armor, and then weapons. Basically, every town is going to have each of these, as well as an inn to restore your party's health. We can't buy much yet, since things aren't supposed to get fucky for a few more minutes, but it can help to preview the stock. You're going to want to upgrade your equipment ASAP, because the fur armor might as well just be a fur coat, and the sword hits like a rolled up piece of tinfoil. Our protagonist is capable of using many types of weapons, but I generally stuck with simple blades. Depending on what you choose, you'll have different accuracy and power stats. Each human character has their own limitations on what they can use, so it can be fun to experiment and see what works best for your party. A handful of mana seeds from the item shop to restore your health will be pretty nice to have until you've got yourself a party with a dedicated healer as well. Feel free to poke around and talk to people for a bit if you want, 
But otherwise, we need to visit the training center, this big building here, and report back to Zodia. He says that this year, we'll be the ones to escort the children to Mount Paulo. Until the screen has a seizure, and a guy runs in screaming about a beast invasion. Well, guess we'll see if that training paid off. Zodia rushes off to the mountain alone to rescue those who are already on their way, and we decide to head back to the priest. The guy's kind of in disbelief about this attack and says that we should head to the nearby town of Lemuria to see if their priest knows anything. Without Michael and Lucifer to protect everyone, things aren't looking good. And so, our adventure begins. About 95% of this game is traveling between towns, grinding out battles, and recruiting demons. So, we better get started. While it may seem a bit daunting at first, the overworld is actually quite small, and generally pretty linear. The geography tends to steer you exactly where you need to go, and if there's a branching path or you have a choice of destinations in front of you, you'll know pretty quick if you chose the wrong one, because the enemies will either rip your asshole out, or you'll be missing a key or something. It's very hard to get lost. The battle system is simple and reminiscent of the two Digital Devil story titles or the first Shin Megami Tensei. Considering Last Bible came right after those three, I guess that makes a lot of sense. It's a system that might have been getting stale at this point, but I can't help but enjoy it. Your options are to fight, set the battle to auto, run, talk, manage your lineup, and view your stats. Pressing fight allows you to assign orders to each of your team members, whether that's just attacking with your equipped weapon, casting a spell, using an item, or defending. I'd recommend leaving auto battling off until you got a few levels under your belt, because you can die in just a few hits. Once you got a good team established and some decent equipment, however, it's a godsend, because while the battle system's alright, it does get pretty repetitive. Managing your lineup is where you'll call demons in and out of battle if you have any, and you can also move around the order that your party is standing in. A good general rule is to keep the weaker guys at the back of the party, but honestly, I couldn't really tell if it made much of a difference as to how often they got hit. Can't hurt to stick with it though. If you choose to speak and attempt to win demons over to your side, you might find that the negotiation system sours part of the experience. The format that negotiation takes in the last Bible has every demon asking you a series of like four yes or no questions in a row, and throughout my entire playthrough, I only saw maybe 12 different possible questions, just presented in a different order each time. There hardly seems to be any logic to it, and your success seems to be just determined by guessing what combination of yes and no that particular demon wants to hear. Once you've figured out that demon's combination, provided you remember it, you can recruit it again instantly if you ever lose it through fusion or on subsequent playthroughs. You can also have recruited demons speak for you, which forgoes the question and answer process and simply leaves things up to a dice roll. Either way, be prepared for repeated failures. It's not like other Megami Tensei games where you can barter with money or exploit personality specific questions or moon phases or something like that, it's just trial and error with the same pools of dialogue over and over. This is one of the biggest problems of the game. Demon recruitment is a core part of the franchise's identity, and considering the other aspects of Last Bible aren't as original as the mainline series, you can see why the whole thing might start to feel bland after a while. Some may enjoy the guessing game of finding out each demon's secret code if you will, but I much prefer the systems featured in other games, even if they are more reliant on RNG. Throwing shit at a wall until it sticks just isn't that fun to me. As for demon fusion, well, that's hard to fuck up. The series staple of combining demons into a stronger one is as fun as any other entry, though this time it's all done through a fusion spell learned by your male partner, who isn't with us yet. Visiting some sort of building to do your fusions isn't a thing in this game, so once you have the fusion spell, you can pretty much do it whenever you want. All in all, the gameplay mechanics are kind of a mixed bag here, and I think your enjoyment of them really comes down to how tolerant you are of repetition and trial and error. I think we can all agree that the art is pretty damn cool though. Sure, you got jizz puddles and angry lizards, but you also got demonic quadrupeds that'll eat your eyes out, and uh, whatever this is. It's different enough from other Megami Tensei games to make it feel somewhat fresh, and I appreciate that. Also, the music in battles and throughout the game is pretty solid, so you got that to look forward to as well. Anyway, hang out around the town, get that money, buy better equipment, and try to recruit two or three demons to soak up some hits before going too far. Within 5 or 10 minutes, you'll gain a handful of levels that'll make things easier. Your stats in this game are endurance, wisdom, strength, speed, and luck. 
you can pretty much build your character however you want. Unlike other entries in this franchise, your character can learn magic, such as attack spells and one that lets you fast travel between towns, so knock yourself out if that's your thing. Keeping your endurance and strength high is my recommendation, so you can just tank hits and pound everything into a pulp, but speed is useful too, especially when it comes to healing before a boss can attack. I don't really know what luck does, but I'm a Gaia master, so I don't need that shit anyway. Lemuria can be found by heading east from Moira, then south. It's the one surrounded by trees. The townspeople mention that beasts have besieged the village of Arrow, which is like 10 feet to the east of Lemuria in a desert. Apparently, the only thing that can save the place is the water of Lete, which can be gathered in an oasis deep into the region. We also learn that some Gaia masters are in town here. Belial, Baal, and Mephisto. You're free to talk to them in their big meeting room. They kinda just look like generic robe dudes instead of, well, demons. The three are considering handing over their piece of orichalcum to placate the beasts, but that's fucking stupid. Let's just go take care of the problem ourselves. On the way out, a kid mentions that Akira had headed off to fight the beasts as well. In fact, he lives in this town, and his family's pretty worried about him. Looks like we'll be meeting up with our first human party member pretty soon. From here, I basically kicked Major Ass outside the town for about an hour straight. See, there's a sword in the shop here in Lemuria, the Kintadu, worth 6,000 maka. You can't just tease me with such massive power this early in the game and expect me not to do it. Besides, the road to the oasis is long, and I wanted to be as prepared as possible. It was really satisfying being able to one-shot most of the demons on the way, but of course this isn't necessary, as long as you get a filled out party and some sturdy armor. You can reach the oasis by heading south from La Maria, and then taking the frustratingly linear windy path through the mountains. For an oasis, this place actually sucks. It's filled with horrific monstrosities that will drain your health bar and likely knock out a few of your demons if you hang around for too long. My least favorite encounter was the bees, so annoying and usually always appearing in groups. Fortunately, to get the water we need, we just gotta touch the pond over here and then we're clear to get the hell out. With the water in hand, head on over to Arrow, but be sure you're rested up and have a healthy party. As we touch the village, a barrier preventing entry constructed by the beasts is dissolved. Inside, we immediately see Akira, who's about to pass out after being defeated by a terrible creature. So who is it? What terrifying, disgusting thing put this town and our friend in such a sorry state? This fucking dork named Java who looks like a goblin made of butter. I killed him in two shots. Granted, I had the beefed up sword, but come on, this was with no demons. Even if you didn't have a weapon at all, he'd go down just as fast with a handful of demons assisting you. What a letdown. Akira thanks us and heads back, letting us know that the town should be returning to normal soon. Well, the only thing truly notable about Arrow is that it has a hospital. If you head back to Akira's house, his mom gets pissed because he hasn't made it back yet, and we kinda just left him on his own after being beaten within an inch of his life. I mean, it was his idea, but I get it. Turns out he's back at the docks place. I love a little mandatory backtracking. Akira decides to join up with us after this, which finally gives us access to the demon fusion spell. Be sure to make use of that consistently as you gather more and more of them. It can be easy to forget sometimes considering it's just another spell on the list presented with zero fanfare. After assuring his mom that everything is all good, we're free to continue with our quest. So, the priests of La Maria are in a back room behind the three Gaia Masters. Talking to them reveals that Zodia has been wounded and help is needed at Mount Paulo. We still don't know why all of this is happening, but at least we got some clear direction on what to do next. Mount Paulo is just to the northwest of Lemuria. It actually looks more like a cave on the map. Run up the stairs and we find Zodia, who laments at the fact that he couldn't help the children. The guy leaning over him asks us to defeat the monster that did this and steps aside. This is essentially the first real dungeon of the game, but it's really small and only has a few simple branching paths. Of course, there are encounters out the ass to ensure that you're here for as long as possible, but aside from that, it's nothing to worry about. You might as well try and nab whatever demons you can here, too. I managed to get one of these big satanic puppies, and I was pretty happy about it. When you reach the edge of this place, you'll find a vampire hanging out on a ledge with the lost kids behind him. He looks a lot more threatening than the first boss, but again goes down in just a few turns. There's no advice I can give other than to just use everything you have, or maybe mash the A button. 
When the vampire dies, the kids each do a 360 ladder jump straight out of a Call of Duty montage and run back to town. All in a day's work. Back at Lemuria, Belial, Ball, and Mephisto have some new dialogue, where they all do their best to downplay your accomplishments. These are the same guys who are about to give up their Oracalcum because some weak demon named Java asks them to. Gaia masters my ass. The priests encourage you to continue investigating the source of the invasion and give you a permit needed to enter a nearby passageway. Before heading out, briefly stay at the inn. You'll see a vision from a goddess urging you not to pursue Gaia. Interesting. Coincidentally, some dude in a bed lets us know that Zodia lived and is currently pursuing Gaia. Thank you, Last Bible. That's some very subtle foreshadowing. Well, let's go get some usage out of our new permit. Our destination is literally right next to Mount Paula, the Western Shrine. Talk to the guard, head on through, and we're in a new section of the overworld. Immediately to the west is Harappa, this backwater shithole filled with people and animals standing around in the mud. We learn here that Rey, the final Gaia Master candidate that we train with, has been kidnapped. We may be able to learn more at the nearby city of Ramu, as Rey happens to be the daughter of Raphael, its high priest. Also, apparently the people there can talk to animals. There's not really much else to do here yet, though one of the houses inexplicably has a kangaroo inside of it and nothing else, and that's pretty funny. Maybe we can chat him up later. Believe it or not, you can actually wander into a base to the north housing the Zord faction, who are suspected of being involved with Ray's kidnapping. You can't really get far into the place because it's simply not time yet, but the enemies do spawn there and offer a ton of XP if you can take them down. To continue the story, we've got to head to Maluha, a town of the south. Here we find out that getting to Ramu is as simple as passing through the Hypnos Shrine. You can also pick up a few tidbits about the Zord. They're a group who goes around killing beasts and harnessing powerful Gaia. Honestly, sounds a bit like us, but I suppose our mass demon slaughter is for a more righteous cause. I mean, at least we haven't kidnapped any women yet. Though, we do bind sentient creatures to our eternal servitude to be used in repeated fights to the death. Just, uh, don't think about it too much. Yet another villager tells us about a dude named Harda who is working to understand the beast on a deeper level. Finally, we can also nab a couple of treasures from a house here. One item of note is the Magnetite. Now, if you played a few games in this franchise, you know Magnetite is typically used as an energy source to summon demons. Lore-wise, it's kind of the same thing here, but mechanically, it couldn't be any more different. And by that, I mean this game just has you use it to trade for items at a handful of locations across the map. Granted, some of these trades are integral to getting the game's best ending, but that's about all it's used for. No resource management or anything else like that to worry about. So, I was kinda under the impression that this Hypnos Shrine standing in our path to Ramu would be something like a dungeon, so I got myself prepared for the worst. New equipment, several more level ups, fusions, all that good shit. Except, it's not a dungeon at all, it's just this little structure to the south where a dude teleports you to the next area. Fuck. Well hold on to your dicks because we're in a whole new continent now. Nearby, you got the village of Jerawan, another cookie cutter area where we can restock after that arduous 20 step journey. One guy in this town clues us in that Lucifer and the others were supposedly trying to create life with Gaia before disappearing. We can also finally meet Harda, the guy studying beasts. He wants to help the creatures live longer lives. Better watch out man, don't want to end up like Lucifer, right? The fairy next to him has one line of dialogue, and it simply says, I'm afraid of dying. What a hauntingly simple piece of character building from which to engage in meaningful existential contemplation. Anyway, if we want to save the girl and talk to animals, we better get to Ramu, so let's blow this shithole and get on with it. It's to the southeast of our position. A bit of a lengthier walk than the past few places, but the encounters shouldn't bother you too much. Predictably, the place is in disarray. Raphael has gone alone to the Tower of the Dark Eye to retrieve the town's stolen Oracalcum. Shit, I mean Ray's missing, her dad's missing, what a goose chase. One step at a time, I suppose. Before heading out to the tower, you might notice there's a girl near the back of the town who claims she can talk to plants, and there's a suspiciously tall tree next to her. Keep this in the back of your mind for a while. The Tower of the Dark Eyes sounds pretty scary, but damn it, it kinda sucks like all the rest. 
the dungeons are so easy in this game, and I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. They're short, lack basically any puzzles or anything, and just feel like minor obstacles at best. The place is off to the east of Ramu. It's just a handful of boring empty floors. There's some treasure you can get on the third floor, but it is placed so lazily out in the middle of the floor that I almost felt insulted taking it. At least make me work for it a little, come on. Actually, aside from another magnetite to carry around, you can also find a dragon bone here. Last Bible has three special demons that can be created by collecting each of their bones. You need to visit a special NPC to do this, which I'll show in a bit, but as long as you're at least partially conscious while playing this, I'm sure you'll find them all. At the top of the tower, you have to fight a- Oh my fucking god. Are you serious? Fuck. A minotaur. If this place had eight floors too, I'd probably commit myself to a mental institution. He's a bit beefy, but I doubt he'll kill you unless you show up to the fight heavily injured. At the opposite end of the room waits Raphael, who had been kept captive by the beast. He and his assistant are shocked at how easily we brought it down. You know, I kind of like the idea that the last Bible protagonist is just that fucking cool. Nothing at all matters to this guy, he's just a silent machine. With that, the day is saved. The Orichalcum is back, the town can go back to normal, it's a happy time. Back at the shrine in Ramu, Roth gives us the soul ring so we can talk to animals. The world is now teeming with specks of additional lore and advice. Every animal is a potential source of information. So remember that dump of a town that was filled with them? Let's hit that up and see where Ray is. This nice dodo bird tells us what I figured out about two hours ago. The Zord took Ray to their cave to the north. Great. Well, the bird gives us a cool key to get further into the place, so let's check it out. As you blast your way through the Zord hideout, be mindful that these guys are a bit tougher than your average mobs. Keep an eye on your health, and if it comes down to it, don't be afraid to throw out a buff spell or two to help yourself along. Grab up all the treasures, beat back all the bandits, and soon enough, we find Rey. She's, well, less than happy about how we've been killing everything in our path. Not like we had much of a choice in the matter, but okay. She basically calls us murdering pieces of shit and runs off. Luckily she isn't far. She's chilling at the kangaroo's house back in the animal town. Ray calls us a Gaia Master fraud and asks if we enjoy all of the killing, then decides to join up with us to monitor our activities. My god, pull that stick out of your ass. Well, this is our last human party member. Ray boasts good recovery spells, so enjoy the added safety net she provides to your team. After assembling the full squad, I headed back to Ramu and told Raphael we saved his daughter. I figured he might want to know about that. Then, I followed the natural curvature of the land and ended up in the town of Tillman. Oh, and for the record, I killed a handful of monsters on the way. So much for Ray's watchful eye. Anyway, as always, this place has an issue only our dumbasses can fix. The town priest's son, Triton, supposedly plans to elope, and he's left town and brought along a special magic staff with him. Not exactly our problem, but these guys have a cool dolphin we can ride, so we're gonna have to help if we want to use it. You can find the dolphin right at the top of town. You need a permit to use it, so just head back to the priest and his wife, tell them what's up, and they let you use it to go find their son. Before heading out, there are a couple neat things to take note of. First, this random ass dude mentions that he saw a guy named Zodia leaving the weapons shop earlier, and says that Zodia is the leader of the Zord. What the shit? That's a hell of a way to find out a pretty critical plot detail. So, yeah, Zodia's up to no good, and abuses his Gaia power. We're definitely gonna be running into him again. Also, just outside of town, you can visit Sage Mountain. This place is pretty useful. If you got three of the same variety of bone, you can get yourself some pretty beefy demons here for free. Be sure to return here and grab those as soon as you do. At the top of the mountain, a sage will teach Ray the Rakarm spell for free, which offers you a way to revive fallen party members. It actually doesn't work during battles, and it has a chance of failing altogether, but it's an alright recovery option for out in the field. Finally, one sage will give you a crest, and asks us to give it to Zodia if we see him again. When you're ready to save Triton, 
hop on the dolphin back in town, and you'll be brought to Orthrus Cavern. Triton is camped out in the back, and summons Orthrus himself to fend us off, thinking that we're Zord members who've come to capture him. So, yeah, the dude never eloped at all. He was just being hunted down and apparently used that as an excuse. Orthrus hits hard, but a few sustained turns of damage from a filled party is more than enough to bring him down. If you're worried about losing your protagonist or something, just have him defend and you'll be fine. After nearly beating his dog to death, Triton begs us to help save it, and you'll need a rune item to revive him. You can find these in some shops, but you probably already have one handy from looting treasure chests. In return, we get Triton's staff, which is equipable by Ray, and Orthrus joins us. Not too bad. Back in town, shit's all peachy again, and another dolphin is ready for us to ride to the next spot on our journey. This little guy drives you straight into the belly of the beast. It shits you out right at the docks in Zord Castle, which is predictably crawling with soldiers and other formidable enemies. Guess it's time to give old Zodia a visit. Make your way through and check every room for treasure. Amusingly, the guards posted at some of the doors want you to go through and meet Zodia, and step aside without any issue. If that's the case, why don't you guys turn off the random encounters too? After a while, you'll run into the guy in a fairly average looking hallway, and he marvels at how strong we've become. He also casually drops the fact that Ray's father, the priest we talked to like 20 minutes ago, has been killed. After saying this, he tells us to come find him and runs out of the room faster than a woman does when they find out you played this game. Alright Zodia, I'll play your little cat and mouse games, suck my nuts. Blast through a hundred million encounters, and there he is. Didn't get too far, huh? He tells us that the whole point of Zord is to annihilate the beasts, and says that Gaia is the one and only thing people can trust in. Gotta have that raw power. Then we gotta fight Morgan, this majestic golden knight that 100% does not match the character's generic pirate sprite on the overworld. His attacks are, like Orthrus, nothing to scoff at, but he just can't keep up with a full party. You hardly need to buff or anything because it's just that unlikely that he'll outdamage you. Random encounters are much, much more threatening than most of these bosses because they can spawn in groups. Anytime it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, aka basically every boss in the game, they just crumble. Impressed with our skill, Zodia says that another Gaia Master murdered Raphael. Everyone that we've been looking up to as heroes the entire time are actually shitheads out to grab as much power as they can for themselves. Zodia says we need to go to Atlantis, where we can witness the meeting of the gods, and then exits, where we can then pass through out to the overworld. Kind of a complicated guy, honestly trying to murder us while also giving us the deep behind the scenes details on the leaders of the world. Okay, Atlantis it is then. Head west across the bridge, and you'll end up in a big stretch of land with a lone inn waiting for us. Here we have another vision from the goddess, who encourages us to seek out the harmonious power of force. She says that true strength comes from realizing that Gaia and force must be united. I see. Ahead of here is a big forest filled with little caves that we can stop to trade in. Each of these caves house friendly monsters we can trade with. This is where that magnetite comes into play. You can get some generally useful items and trinkets for battle here, but I'd honestly advise saving your magnetite for later, unless your pockets are overflowing with it. We're gonna need three pieces to trade with Heart of the Beast Investigator later, so keep that in mind. One of these beasts explains that Orichalcum is needed to keep them alive, which means beasts and people would be just fine living together if they could just learn to share, or some shit like that. There are also actually some hidden caves you can find by walking into certain sections of the forest. One towards the western end is the Fairy Cave, where you can get a couple pieces of magnetite and a bit of brief dialogue. Another one, the Cerberus Cave, houses some treasure, as well as a freely recruitable Cerberus who's happy to see a friendly human. Further northwest is yet another inn, oddly, and a beast lair. Here, Harda asks for the three magnetite shards to help out his monster buddies. Give these over as soon as possible to get it over with. In return, he gives us the ability to speak with plants, 
So at this point, we can talk to every living thing in existence. That might sound cool, but seriously, imagine how fucked up that would be for a second. You'll never have a moment's peace again for as long as you live. Birds, grass, trees, all that shit just talking non-stop for all of eternity. What a nightmare. Fortunately, gameplay-wise, we can actually only talk to a handful of big trees, like the one in the upper left corner of this area. This guy, the Tree of Life, gives a new spell to Akira as a blessing from the goddess. The spell is called Ranka and deals heavy damage, though it takes a while for him to cast it. Pretty cool nonetheless. When you're finished here, another Hypno Shrine is to the north, which takes us closer to Atlantis. The first place you're likely to run into is Cretona, which is about as run of the mill as a town can get. Restock and upgrade, and poke around with the NPCs for a minute. One guy claims that Lucifer and Baal are about as insane as the Zord, and that he's always hated them. A couple of kids talk about Hiram, their father, and the flying ship he's building. His wife confirms that he's currently in Atlantis, so get hyped, we'll have an airship soon. On the way towards the next settlement, I ran into a Medusa out in the overworld, and was surprised to see that she was completely naked. I don't actually have anything else to say about that, I just took a clip of it for some reason, so I must have thought it was worth showing in the video. I ran into her by going northeast immediately after exiting Crotona. Atlantis is actually like six steps due east of the town, and I just barely avoided seeing it because the screen didn't scroll far enough down. So much for a long journey. I could probably spit farther than the distance between these two towns is. Yeah, so if you thought Atlantis would be some underwater city, well, it's not. But it does have a sewer system we can explore. I guess that's close enough. In Atlantis's shrine, Baal and Belil are there, and think it's ridiculous to assume that they would have killed Raphael, and together with the priests decide that Zord needs to be killed off for good. Baal assures us that Zodia has been lying, and to be fair, he is a little suspicious, but I'm pretty sure the masters are just trying to keep us under control for the time being. Well, we got no choice but to go along with it, so let's keep looking around. From a nearby locked door down the hall, we can hear Hiram's voice, who insists that he's busy at the moment. Alrighty then. Outside, a guy is all frantic about how beasts have invaded Atlantis' sewers. To reach those, we just gotta leave town through the top exit, so let's put on our plumber shit and take a look. Blast away these Anubises that jump you at the entrance, then jump down into the poop pipe. The stuff lurking around down here is actually pretty terrifying. Can you imagine seeing these in some drainage pipe? My god. There's some pretty decent treasure down here, including a Muramasa sword and some stat boosting charms, so give it a good once over and make sure you don't miss out. I guess it's fair to call this place a proper dungeon. Unlike those caves or the evil eye tower, there's something of a gimmick here, although it's pretty simple. Basically, the entire underground is scattered with different little islands and staircases, and you're bouncing around between them trying to find your way to the path forward on the surface. I recommend just checking all possible routes anyway, because it won't take long, and you can come across another talking tree that gives Akira a spell. Eventually, you'll end up in a back room of the shrine, and you can listen to a Gaia Master and some beasts talking about the Orichalcum that had been stolen from Raphael before he was killed. So, to nobody's surprise, yes, our supposedly noble and heroic leaders are actually scheming murderers. The guy also reveals that Lucifer, Baal, and all the others created the beasts. Shit. Well, moving on, we end up in Hiram's locked room. Except, it's actually some Zord guy who says that Hiram has been imprisoned in a town called Dalo. Since we kind of have him cornered, he gives us the key to his cell. Guess that's our next destination. So much for a meeting of the gods, right? Atlantis was just one big letdown. We're getting really close to the end game now, which is coincidentally the coolest part of the entire thing, so let's see what's up in Dalo. It's actually just west of Kurtona. Another short journey. In the shrine, the priests claim that the Zord have already been beaten back out of the city, and that only their boss Zodia needs to be defeated to do away with them entirely. Well that was fast. This might sound like good news until you remember that this is exactly what the Gaia Masters wanted. I mean, Zodia isn't exactly the most noble guy, 
and the group did resort to kidnapping and violence to keep Ray away from the Masters, but they were about the only ones capable of putting up some resistance against them. Sure, both sides were in it for the raw power, but the Zord were necessary for keeping the Gaia Masters occupied. It's gonna be on us to see an end to each faction. In the same room we can unlock Hiram, who explains that the Zord had him building arcs for them. He decides to head back to Atlantis and offers to build us an arc, and we're gonna need that shit if we want to bring the world back to balance. In the back of Hiram's cell, a couple of Zord guys ask us to save their headquarters, which the priests and Gaia Masters have already left to destroy. They give us an item called the Bird, which I don't know if it's actually a bird or what, but apparently it'll get us into Zord HQ. As for saving them, I don't know, guess we'll see when we get there. First, let's drop in on Hiram's family back in Crotona and let them know he's all good. His wife offers us a lapis as thanks for helping out, which can make ships fly. The more you know. Stop by Atlantis, drop off the stone, and Hiram begins constructing us an arc. He says it'll take a while and runs off, so let's topple ourselves a faction in the meantime. To the northeast of Dalo, in a snowy area, you'll find a big circle of stones. Step in the center, and your party raises the bird item to the sky, which conjures up a tornado that brings you straight to the Zord headquarters. As you make your way past the place's beefy monsters, you'll notice dead Zord soldiers lying all over the place. Looks like we might be a bit too late. One straggler shouts about how he saw the Gaia Masters bring all of the roaming beasts with them, and a few priests are scattered around, seemingly confused about where the Masters have gone and what they did with the Auric Algum. At the end of a massive hallway, we find Zodia, who's accepted his defeat. He vows to bring down Lucifer and all the others somehow, someday, and as one final training session, decides to challenge us to a battle to the death. Zodia hits like a truck, and magic attacks seem to have little, if any, effect on him. You'll want to buff up your physical attacks for this fight and ensure everyone is consistently topping off their HP. While it is still hard for Zodia to back you into a position you can't get out of, he can surprise you and kill off party members who are sitting at about half capacity. He can also hit you with some random status effects like sleep and poison, though they aren't much to be concerned over. When Zodia falls, he admires our power one final time and insists that we kill off the Gaia Masters, who created the beasts and sought to control the world with them. Then, all of a sudden, Mephisto, Belial, and Baal appear, laughing at Zodia's defeat. They decide to kill us off too, however, the group makes a fatal mistake and decides to leave the job only to Mephisto, meaning it's another simple fight against a lone enemy. If only all three attacked at once, they might have had a better chance of getting away with their plan. Mephisto is even easier than Zodia, and falls within seconds. He dies cursing our name, and then we're back out in the snow alone. The Zord are gone. The Gaia Masters have officially declared all-out war on us. Let's finish this shit up. Hiram is glad to present the Ark to us after returning to Atlantis, declaring it a masterpiece. Before embarking on our final journey, I decided to stay at the inn, and ended up receiving a goddess vision. She calls on us to rise, seek out the power of force, and receive Michael's blessing. You know, I almost forgot about him. Could he be the one good guy a master? Outside, the ship is ready, and the whole world is now at our fingertips. Flying around, you'll notice it's not very big. Fly for just a bit to one edge of the map, and you'll quickly emerge on the other side. Sorry to any flat earthers out there. Essentially, to find Michael and complete the final bits of the game, you're just going to want to fly around to any places you haven't been yet. It's not as hard as it might sound. In fact, it's actually pretty fun because you're finally given some freedom to really explore. Your first order of business should be to return to Sage Mountain and finally assemble those bones you've been collecting. These demons are strong as shit and have massive health pools. My favorite was the dragon just because its health is so far above everything else. These demons aren't a requirement or anything like that for completing the game, but it does make the final stretch a bit more manageable, and they're just fun to use. Afterwards, we're off to find some new lands. There's one big island you can reach that has a mountain range going down the middle of it. 
There's no other way to get here except by flying, and it's a good place to start. The top structure on the left side is a sage shrine, where a robed man asks for a rune. After giving it to him, he says that Mephisto had attacked him, and now only the power of force may be enough to defeat him. The man tells us to seek the plants for more advice. Well, we do know a few places with some talkative plants. First, let's check out the structure of the south, then we'll get on that. This one's another sage shrine, where the guy just gives you a stat booster before suddenly being possessed by Mephisto. Bruh, we were just talking about you. Well, let's see how tough this bastard is now. Mephisto's second form dodges attacks very frequently and puts out modest damage. It was common for about half my team to just miss every round, but he's not the sturdiest guy around, so every attack you land is pretty serious and takes a lot off his health bar. For all the effort he must have gone through to revive himself, I have to say, I thought he could do better. All that's left after this is to check out the right side of the island, where we have Peter Cavern. Come on, seriously? What kind of goofy ass name is that? Inside, you got some treasures, and a series of ladders leading downwards to a dark gathering of wizards most foul. I'm not even fucking around. These guys will take the demons you built out of bone, and give them skin, making them even more OP than they already were. The dragon's health shoots up to 999, and the bonuses gained by the others are impressive as well. Finally, one of these guys will give Rey a spell that gives a guaranteed revive with full health. Nice. Alright, now it's time to use our brains a bit. Where were all those talking trees? Well, first off, there was the one in Hardo's Beast Settlement near that big forest. This tree passes along a message from Michael. Turns out, Harda actually is Michael, who knows we're seeking the power of force. He sends us to Ramu to talk to that one tree I said to take note of way back when we first got there. Told you'd end up being a really important tree. Known as the Fraxinus tree, it blesses us with light dew, which unlocks yet another somewhat cryptic area where we can meet Michael. To get to him, you have to have the light dew in your inventory and fly over this little island with a lake in the center, where it begins to glow and whisks you away. This shit's a bit goofy, but I think it can kind of be forgiven because the world is just so small that it doesn't take long to figure out whether it's on purpose or by accident. It feels like something out of an NES game, but I'll take it over being railroaded along a tight path. If only this game could have struck a better balance between way too much direction and not quite enough. We end up in Nova Ramu, an almost heaven-like realm filled with animals and beasts. Harda, aka Michael, stands waiting, glad that we've made an effort to seek out Harmony. He teaches us the move Stardust, a damage spell. A tree above him teaches Akira yet another free spell, which takes multiple rounds to conjure up, but does insane damage. Inside of a structure nearby, you can meet the demon Solion, who, if you're carrying around Cerberus and Orthrus, will fuse with them and join your party. Inside the center room is the goddess herself, who commends our efforts and teaches us, at long last, the Force ability. She again assures us that Gaia is strength and Force is peace, and sends us on our way with the blessing of the universe, hoping that we will bring the two forces together somehow. Nearby, you can also find a Force armor set, naturally the best in the game. Okay, so, God's a woman, we have the best demons, weapons, armor, and spells in the entire game, and we have the blessing of the universe to bring things to an end. There's one area left we haven't visited. Deep in the mountains, there's a zone with a weird eagle crest carved into the ground. In the caves nearby, one fairy explains that the masters decided to steal the Orichalcum of Ramu and murder Raphael to ensure their beasts would live long lives. Another asks us to use that symbol outside, called a geoglyph, to head to the world of Terra and defeat the masters fly your arc over the crest, and this is where the game starts to get a little fucking wacky in a really interesting way. You're about to see just how powerful the last Bible protagonist really is. We end up hurtling through space with no control over the ship, until another ship piloted by Belial slams into us 
and immediately attacks. On the first turn, he put a few of my guys to sleep, but I was able to keep up the offensive with my supremely powerful demons from earlier. Belial has a pretty substantial amount of health, so it'll take a minute or two to wear him down, but honestly, he's just a little warm up for what's coming next. After he goes down, you'll end up in a rocky, mountainous place with a nearby cave. It houses a very useful healing spring, which is a free way to restore your entire party. Consider it the game's final checkpoint. To the west is a strange, almost alien-like structure known as Luciferium. The place is filled, of course, with challenging encounters from groups of powerful enemies, as well as a series of ladders to climb around on. As you climb your way to the top of this place, you'll have to make your way through one more Gaia Master before we can meet the boss man, Ball. He starts yelling at us about his desire to use beasts to control the world, and then challenges us. How original. Ball has the ability to paralyze party members, so keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, just beat on him as hard as possible. You don't really have to worry about burning through magic or anything, because you're free to just head back out to the healing spring, so have fun, use your abilities to their fullest extent. As he dies, he starts mauling about how we don't know what it means to create life, and says we could never relate to the joy it brought him. Well, here we go. At the top of Luciferium is who else but Lucifer. He says that Gaia is what made our planet livable. It also created life, and Orichalcum is necessary to sustain that life. He says that he can never abandon his beasts, and launches into an attack. Alright, the old classic. On the first turn, he one-shotted Ray, leaving me without a good healer. This snowballed out of control gradually, and I died not long after. Yeah, the first boss in the entire game to actually kill me. Fortunately, it's not a difficulty spike, but it was unlucky. The guy smacks just a bit harder than the others, and has a slightly longer health bar. Doesn't this all seem a bit too easy? I mean, come on. The final dungeon was a cave with wooden ladders. And I said just a few minutes ago that this game was about to get crazy. This isn't that interesting. Well, watch this shit. As Lucifer dies, he urges us to do for the beast what he couldn't on his own, and then vanishes. Suddenly, the Orichalcum he had stolen begins flashing red, and we get a cutscene of our party watching as the planet and space around it turn to red and then vaporize. The goddess tells us that Lucifer's power has resonated with the Orichalcum, and the history of the planet has come to an end. However, we're not going to die with it. Because we did all that extra shit earlier to help out Michael and gain the power of force, we will be the ones to rise to the task of creating a new history. Compare this to the Game Boy version where after you beat Lucifer, you just return the Orichalcum and the game ends. Fuck that. The goddess begins to enter a period of dormancy and quickly blesses us with a spell to be cast when the world's end is at its climax. That spell is called, uh, Kokido Elkos. Bit of a weird name, right? I mean, what the hell's that supposed to mean? Just keep it in mind for now. Our arc fades away, and we've got no choice but to book it back in the direction of the healing spring. Touch the geoglyph, and we seem to end up on the moon, which has a single black monolith looming in the distance. It brings us to a strange room floating in space, and a voice welcomes us to the labyrinth of the monolith, a castle which contains the record of everything in the universe. Who's talking? Well, get this. It's not just God, like in every other SMT game. It's the Lord of all creation, the universal will, the fabric of reality itself. I mean, this shit blew me away. It's all rinky-dink fantasy quests for 8 hours, and then we're in a room beyond the boundaries of space and time, talking to what is arguably the single most powerful thing in any Mega Ten title. You rarely get to interact with the Great Will in these games. It's a concept mentioned, but hardly ever serving any purpose other than background lore. If you ask me, this is some really neat shit. It says that all gods dance in the palm of its hand, and flat out says that we will not be allowed to create a new planet for ourselves. What happened was written into the universe and cannot be undone. 
Unless, of course, this was all to lead us here and have us become the next lord of all creation. It challenges us to complete the labyrinth and fight to determine who is better fit to be a leader. And now, it's time for one hell of a boss rush. As you navigate the maze, tons of beings warp in and give you brief tidbits about the foundation of the universe. From fucking Zarathustra, to Odin, to Pazuzu, to a new version of Michael the Archangel, and even Loki. It really goes on for quite a while, and is a fitting challenge to cap off the game with. Slowly but surely make your way through, proving to each of the gods that you possess the courage, knowledge, and willpower to create a new universe until there's nothing left but, well, the universe itself. As you approach the center of the labyrinth, we meet a being named Lassabellic, the voice who introduced us to the place, and essentially, a fragment of the universal will, or a weaker, more comprehensible version of it. It explains that force was a great obstacle in building the universe, and Gaia was made to balance it out, to no avail. Force continued to threaten the universal will, as it could not be contained, and so it decided to destroy our world. Yeah, the Gaia masters and training the youth and all that shit were a move by this thing to generate more Gaia and suppress force. But the further we got along in our journey, the more we realized with the goddess's help that it could be a good thing that brings peace. After defeating Lucifer, the most beefed up Gaia motherfucker in the world, the universal will here essentially pressed the reset button on our ass, afraid of what it couldn't control. However, since we're standing right here, I guess even that wasn't enough. Let's show it what's up. Lassabellic is a total joke, almost certainly to drive home the fact that the worst is yet to come, and that what we're up against is way out of our league. This is only one small piece of something inconceivable, and it wants you to know that as it slowly wears you down, fight by fight. When Lassabellic goes down, a hooded figure begins warping all around us. Then, another generic one emerges to speak with us, talking about how weird it is that since everything is imbued with the energy of the universe, it is essentially about to kill itself and has no idea what the outcome will be, or if it even matters. Then, it starts. Without a doubt, one of the most badass fights in the entire franchise. At first, nothing works against the universal will. At least, until you remember those magic words from the goddess, Kokido Elkos. Now what does that mean? It really stumped me for a long time. For months after I beat this game, the word would just randomly pop into my head. Only by examining a future entry in the series did I manage to figure it out, and I think it's pretty interesting. In one of the last Bible New Testament games, the protagonist learns an ability called Wade Amo Ueni Wade Adi, which is crucial to getting them through a similarly desperate situation. In English, that translates to, I think, therefore I am. Now, look at Kokido Elkos again, and say it slow. It kinda sounds like a butchered version of Kogito Ergo, as in Kogito Ergo Sum. I think, therefore I am. That's so sick. So, cast the spell, and at the cost of the protagonist's life, the whole screen starts to glitch the fuck out, weakening this thing to the point that attacking it actually does something. So yeah, by sheer determination, our guy makes the universal will manifest to the point of being harmed by physical weapons. He goes out in a blaze of glory just to give your team a shot at reviving their planet. You're fighting with a bit of a handicap here. Finally, I can say it. The Universal Will is a challenging boss. You need to be on top of your game here and plan your moves carefully. Hopefully you brought some MP restoring items, otherwise you want to conserve all of your energy for healing whenever possible. It's a long fight. Individual blows to your team can deal hundreds of points of damage, and if it's on your healers, you can quickly get into a tricky position where a slow death is almost assured. You'll be glad you have those high HP bone demons, because having to heal every turn will prolong your victory for that much longer. Be damn sure you're buffed up for this one, and hang in there for as long as possible, always playing it safe. After a while, you'll beat the universal will, 
who drops $2 for some reason before sending the screen into another leptic fit. It admits defeat, but reminds us that this victory is not forever. In the vast span of eternity, there will always be conflict, and of course, one day everything will fade away to nothingness. It tells us to never forget that we are a part of it, and that we will walk our new path until we inevitably meet Ruin. It bids Akira and Rei farewell, confident it will see them again, and they're dropped back on the moon. The screen fades to black, and our character starts talking to them from beyond death, saying that fate has permitted them to live. The two awaken on an unfamiliar shore, confused. Akira asks where they are, to which Rei replies that they're on Terra, the third planet from the sun. Above, they see the moon, and say that everything has felt like a dream. Akira wonders if their homeland is still out there somewhere, but Rei is sure that it is not. Gazing out at a beautiful sunset, the two realize this is their homeland now, and the goddess encourages them to begin anew, despite the tragedy they may endure. And that's it. So was it all an elaborate origin story for life on Earth? And why was that so similar to the end of Evangelion? I don't know, but I gotta say, it almost made that generic ass fantasy slog feel like it was worth it. Last Bible is one of those games that's so frustratingly mediocre that it can be pretty hard to sell someone on playing it. Sure, it's a competent enough RPG, especially considering it was released on portable systems in the 90s, but if you've ever so much as touched another game in that genre, I think you'll inevitably find that it's below average overall. It does absolutely nothing special beyond that final act. It's a shame that the most original and interesting aspects of this plot are bonus content only found on one version of the game, and it's not even the version we got in the US. If it weren't for that extra content, I'd have been a lot more negative on this game. The fact that the entire story is just the universe repeatedly trying and failing to control primordial magic before essentially throwing its hands up in the air and fighting itself to decide what to do next is one neat twist. And if I played the Game Boy version, where things end immediately after Lucifer, I likely would have thrown this game out the window. This is easily a D-tier game for me when comparing it to the rest of the franchise, but I do give it some credit for those shining moments. It's not my intention to discourage you from playing this. In fact, if you're interested in the Last Bible Trilogy, you should at least try it out. The next two games that follow build on the lore established in here in fresher, more entertaining ways, and it's pretty damn cool to see that universe grow and change as you make your way through it, with the gameplay getting better each time. Just don't expect anything groundbreaking, and this game can be an okay time waster. Oh yeah, and the protagonist of Last Bible could solo any mainline protagonist. Feel free to leave an angry comment about that. So, I'm sure you're dying to know what's gonna happen on Terra next. Well, you're in for a treat. It's time for Last Bible 2. Megami Tensei Gaiden Last Bible 2 was first released in 1993 on the Game Boy, and got an updated re-release on the Game Boy Color in 1999. Each of these versions, just like the first game, feature both a story mode and a multiplayer battle mode. The game was also brought to the 3DS eShop in 2012. Unfortunately, Last Bible 2 never received the Game Gear treatment like its predecessor, and it never left Japan, making it feel kind of like a forgotten sibling in a family of already obscure titles. When it comes to choosing which version to play, I think the choice is obvious. You're gonna want to play the one that has fucking color in it. So, is Last Bible 2 a worthy sequel to the original? Does it do anything better, or is it just another mediocre shitstorm with a few shining moments? Let's get down to it again, and see whether or not this middle entry to the trilogy is worth playing. When we start up a new game, it's time to name some party members. Those of you that love canon names are gonna shit yourself here. Since the characters I made up for the first game have already finished their story, including the one I named after myself, I'm just gonna stick with what I get here. So the main character's name is Yuri, and our female ally's name is... Sophia? You know what? I lied. I'm gonna change one letter. Sophia rolls off the tongue way better. 
Finally, our male ally's name is Esau. From here, we get some background on the world of Terra and how this game picks up from the previous one. The connection is kinda loose, but it's there. The text largely explains what you'll already know if you played the first game. A long ass time ago, life came to be on the fifth planet from the sun. With the power of Gaia, they possessed the abilities of gods, such as teleportation, telepathy, and more. Those who had mastered these powers were naturally known as Gaia Masters. Despite the impressive knowledge of the people of the fifth planet, war with the planet's beasts eventually led to a disaster which forced the survivors to escape to Terra, the third planet. To absolutely nobody's surprise, things weren't much better on Terra, and conflict between men and beasts continues today. After this little setup sequence, we're taken to the throne room in the Kingdom of Magoku. A soldier rushes in and tells the king that someone named Lord Medoc has arrived. Medoc brings with him a grim prophecy. Soon, a child in Magoku will be born. This child will be the reincarnation of Gryas, the King of Beasts, an ancient being who warred with humans 2,000 years ago. The king freaks the fuck out and comes to the natural conclusion of having all newborn children executed. Then, the game jumps 15 years into the future, and we wake up in a forest surrounded by beasts. That's right, we're Yuri, reincarnation of King Gryas. Looks like those old fucks missed a spot during their killing spree. The game only flat out says that you're King Gryas at the very end and treats it like a massive spoiler but the secret is about as subtle as having your dick smashed with a bowling ball. Now, I actually think the story has a hint of cleverness to it, if you compare it to the first Last Bible. In the original game, you're chosen to become a Gaia Master, a hero to all, and a leader of the people. This game is essentially the exact opposite. You're chosen to be a Beast King who will lead a race reviled by humanity. It's a neat idea to take basically the same backdrop for each game, a planet locked in a beast versus human war, but start you off closer to opposing factions in each one. So here we are, in our little safe grove with our beast pals. You start off with jack shit in your inventory. Before you even try to leave and find the first town, be sure you pick this place clean. One beast says that we should let mom know that we'll be heading out. Our adoptive mother is this kind being named Soleon, who has raised us since we were nearly killed as an infant. Another beast that looks like a pixie says that our friend Larsa came by recently from the town Ein. That'll be our first destination once we're ready. Interestingly, everyone in that town kinda hates us, so who knows if we'll get a warm welcome. At the top of this place, you got two caves. The open cave has a healing fountain where you can get a free refill on HP and MP. This is a solid place to return to in the game's opening chapters. The other is being blocked by Soleon herself, who asks if we're hungry. Saying yes has her offer us the money and weapon inside, so that we can venture over to town for some food. Inside we find a simple, cheap sword, a robe, and a hundred bucks. We're gonna want to switch this shit out soon, but it's an okay start since the place is such a short walk away. Well, let's get to it. While this game looks and plays a lot like the first Last Bible, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. It's better. Not like excellent, but a noticeable improvement for sure. Combat is improved, negotiation is a thousand times better, moon phases exist now, it's way more enjoyable. Your set of commands for combat function practically the same as the first Last Bible. You can fight, talk, run, set the fight to play out automatically, view your stats, and adjust your lineup. Fighting allows you to choose between physical and magical attacks, as well as using an item or guarding. Magic is just as viable as weapons are, so you'll often have a wide array of options at your disposal. Interestingly enough, the guard ability actually works differently than in the first game. Now, if you have multiple party members, you can have someone guard another person and absorb hits for them. I can say for a fact that it doesn't work like this in the Game Gear version of Last Bible 1, and it's a pretty great change that allows for additional strategy against bosses. Negotiation is far, far better than before, which is just a fucking godsend. The trial and error yes and no questions are gone, replaced by a system resembling mainline Shin Megami Tensei games. Demon Dialogue has a bit more personality now, 
and you can request items or gold from them in addition to having them join you. Enticing demons with money can affect the outcome of a conversation, and the introduction of moon phases further enhances the experience, with the position of the moon often greatly affecting your success. A full moon means monsters will basically never join you, while a dark moon gives you a much better chance. Specific monsters are even affected by half moons, and timing your negotiations accordingly can be a fun way to efficiently build up a team. There's even a time limit imposed on conversations, meaning if you stay silent, demons will notice and grow suspicious of you. It's a pretty generous limit to be fair, but it's yet another neat mechanic that makes the game feel much more immersive in comparison to the first. To sum it all up, they fixed negotiation. It's good now. What makes this game even better is that negotiation is only the beginning. Sure, fusing your demons into better ones is still an option, but now, demons can use equipment. That's sick as hell. If you found the demon you really like, its longevity can be stretched even further by equipping it with appropriate weapons and armor. While they can't level up, it's nonetheless an awesome addition that I wish more games in the franchise used. Finishing off the battle system, viewing your stats functions exactly as it sounds. You've got endurance, intelligence, strength, speed, and luck. There are no particular guidelines to follow with your character, build yourself up according to what you want to do. Whether that's tanking hits, hitting harder, being better at casting, acting quicker, or, um, being luckier. Finally, the lineup system works just like it did in the other game. People near the top of the list take more hits, and those in the back take less. It seems to work much more consistently here than in the original Last Bible, so that's good. This menu is also where you'll switch demons in and out of the party. Really, the only complaint I can come up with for this game's mechanics is that the text moves really slow by default, and the menus take a bit longer than they should to click through. The text speed can be changed in the options, but the slowness of opening and closing the equipment menu seems to be unavoidable, unfortunately. Once you've got a handle on the game's basic mechanics, head on over to Ein, just to the southwest over a bridge. The first guy you see immediately recognizes you as that kid who was raised by beasts. As you'll find out, the people who live here are racist as fuck. Take a walk around and you'll find an equipment store, an item shop, and an inn, as well as several houses. A woman resting at the inn mentions that someone in the next room is searching for the legendary city of Blantica, where wishes are granted. Sure enough, it's Esau, who doesn't say much for now, but as we know, is fated to go along on a journey with us. Poor guy. Over in the item shop, you can find some shithead who says, I hope you're not offended by this, but I hate beasts. You know, if the intent for this world, Terra, the third planet from the sun, was for it to resemble Earth, I'd say they got the amount of assholes just right. A guy across the table complains about some creature known as Velg who steals the town's food supplies and lives in a cave to the northwest. Sounds like a prime spot for our first adventure. But first, let's follow up on what we learned from that pixie in the forest. Our friend Larsa should be around here somewhere. Sure enough, a villager tells us that Larsa and his girlfriend Media were just sucking face somewhere nearby. This guy must be a stalker or some shit, because Media is actually in the house he's standing next to, and she talks about having a surprise gift ready for Larsa's birthday. Larsa is in the house just down the street, yelling at his mom about how he hates this bum-ass town and wants to go on adventures. He sees us awkwardly standing in the doorway and runs off. Well, before catching up, rob his house of valuables. You can get a nice new shield and a spear. The only place left to go in this town is the Flower Garden, accessible through an exit at the north end. There, two people stand. A girl named Crow and some quiet edgelord named Zodia. Wait, Zodia? I mean, it's obviously not the same dude as the first game, but I don't know, maybe we should keep an eye on this one. He basically white knights for the girl and tells us to back off from trying to talk to her, but she thinks we're cool and explains that the two are on a journey, to which Zodia gets irritated and runs off. Before we can even react, Larsa runs up behind us and reveals that we have the same birthday, though he didn't get us anything. Fortunately, Media saves the day and the three all share friendship pendants. How sweet. 
Well, with nothing better to do, Larsa joins up, and we decide to head off and slay Velg to save the town's food. Let's do this shit. Be sure to equip your weapons and armor, stock up on healing items, and grab a demon if you can. I brought a kobold along with me for some backup. A pretty great thing about this game is that the bosses actually feel like a challenge instead of an A button mashing competition, so you actually have to pay attention sometimes now. Unfortunately, the dungeons are still pretty weak throughout, but I'll take what I can get. Head west and then north from town, and before long you'll see a cave tucked into the mountains. It is like comically small and easy to navigate. There is one branching path, and it leads directly to a big egg. This cute little guy asks us to protect him, and if you summon him to your active party, you'll notice he only has one HP. So what are you supposed to do about this? Well, every time someone takes a hit in place of the egg, the amount of damage dealt to it is replenished. Protect the egg from enough attacks, and soon it'll hatch into a strong beast. There are a handful of these eggs to be found along your journey, and it's always worth taking the time to hatch them if you ask me. Not only is it simple, but they're extremely useful as well. Head down the other pass to the stairs, grab the spare mana lying around which can replenish your health in battle, and then confront Velg. He's this big green bird fuck and can take quite a beating before dying. He has over 300 HP, which is pretty steep if you haven't spent time upgrading your gear or assembling a full party. Magic works great against Velg, so if you've leveled up enough to learn some attack magic, throw that at him for some good damage. It's possible to beat him without any demons. As you can see, I tried to do it here before the egg even hatched, but it's far simpler to just mess around with negotiation and gang up on him. When Velg goes down, he promises to behave himself and runs out of the cave. Larsa gets all excited about how nobody could stop him if he continued to train his Gaia, and then we get warped back to Ayn. Looks like things have gotten busy since we left. Soldiers from the Magoku Kingdom are here doing a recruitment drive, along with Medok, who rants about Gryas coming to kill everyone. It's a good thing he doesn't recognize that we're standing right in front of him. Larsa decides to join up with Magoku and hone his skills, and Medok tells him to head north and meet up with some other soldiers. Wait, north? Like, where our forest is? Oh shit. By the time we arrive, it's far too late. The place is crawling with warriors who are driving all of the beasts away. Assuming that we're a new recruit, they all are just to join their hunt. Slip into the cave previously guarded by Soleon, and a lone guard scolds us for interfering in his activities. Let's take him down and try to save our friends. While he doesn't possess nearly as much endurance as Velg did, the fighter here doesn't take any damage from the magic we have at this point in the game, so it's gonna come down to beating on him with weapons. Fortunately, Larsa has pretty high strength and will be a big help in that. You know, wouldn't this be considered treason for Larsa considering he just joined this army? Whatever, I appreciate the help nonetheless. A good few turns of consistent damage is about all you need, provided you have durable equipment. As the guard dies, we see some of our beast friends crying. Mom's been taken away. Shit. As we leave, Larsa goes his separate ways, remaining our friend but acknowledging that we now have different goals. So, what do we do now? Well, you might recall seeing Esau back in the town earlier. We know he's important somehow, so let's go see what he's up to. You don't have to look for long because his ass is parked right at the town's entrance. After our little stint with saving the place, he's impressed with our abilities and wants to travel together. As we learned previously, Esau is looking to have a wish granted at the lost city of Blantica. He believes finding this city is key to saving his family, and we'll each have a better chance of getting what we want if we work together. He tells us to head to the northwest, and we're on our way. Just past Velg's cave is an extremely tiny port village. I don't know, I think there's something really comfy about this place. For whatever reason, the world of Last Bible 2 appeals to me a lot more than the first. It feels a bit more carefree and less dingy, and I can't really put my finger on why. There's an inn if you need to rest, and that's about it. The house over is totally fucking empty. The ship here takes us over to a place called Lutz. It's worth popping into this building right when you get there to grab a beast bone. Just like the first game, 
You can collect these and construct a special demon once you have enough of the same type. Rather than doing this all at one place, however, this game features several shrines spread across the map dedicated to each beast. Doing our usual once-over of the town, we learn that Magogu's soldiers have headed northeast, apparently in the direction of a pixie village. Heading east from this town is obviously where we want to go, but if you take the western path, you can find a secret cave with another bone in it. There's actually quite a few of these invisible caves. I'm not going to mention all of them because most of the time they aren't really that important, but it's worth knowing that just because a path looks empty, that doesn't mean there isn't anything there. Hit up the pixie village, and just like back at the forest, you'll find the place under siege. To save the village, we gotta take down another fighter, but it's the same deal as before, and with the help of Esau and the experience we've gained since then, the battle is a total joke. The pixies are thankful, yet concerned over the possibility of future attacks. An optional side quest can be found in a house on the left here if you're interested. To help protect the village, you're asked to provide a powerful demon to help guard the place. Now, if you just hand over a shitty worm or something like that, you aren't going to get anything in return. If the demon is level 10 or higher, however, returning to the village at the end of the game will give you a special reward in the form of an extremely powerful suit of armor. Definitely a long-term investment that requires you to not forget about this place about 7 hours from now, but well worth it. Just to the north of here is a cave. Quickly pass through, and you come out near Sidon, a town that has some pretty critical shit, namely a demon fusion building. Talk to the old fart here in the summoning circle, and you're free to combine demons all you like at no cost. If you've got any fusion needs you want to take care of, it's best to do it now, otherwise you'll have to walk back or take the time to warp with an item or a spell. To my knowledge, this is the only place in the game with a fusion area before acquiring the fusion spell. In the back rooms, some other guys are talking about Sophia, the rebellious, rough-around-the-edges apprentice who is off causing trouble somewhere. There's also another port here, making the town somewhat of a nexus between several locations. Before leaving town, check out the guys gathered around the dock on the lower left. The ship has been attacked by beasts. Looks like a good opportunity to boost up our stats a bit. Hop on with your freshly fused demons and make your way to the lower levels of the ship. The encounters here are excellent for grinding if you have a few minutes to spare, considering the inn is just outside if you need to recover. The boss is two Darkla demons. They don't have any resistances to worry about, but two moves per turn means you'll want to ensure you come prepared. These guys can actually insta-kill you with a Mudo spell, though it never successfully landed on me. I managed to put them asleep a couple of times with magic, so if you got a demon with Dormeen, be sure to use it. Back outside, the sailors are happy that you've taken care of the, uh, infestation and get back to what they were doing before. Alright. Well, you may notice there's another ship in the docks bound for Bolton. You can go here if you want and mess around with things for a bit, but it's best to head out of town on foot for a while and take care of a few other things. The neat thing about Last Bible 2 is that it's a little less linear than the first game. You can actually complete some objectives in whatever order you desire, with slightly different quest outcomes in a couple of cases. What we're looking for is to the northeast. Esau lives in this area, and has a whole ass base of operations set up here devoted to finding Blantica that we can visit to progress the plot a bit further. When we arrive, Esau has a conversation with one of his men right in front of the exit, so we got a little bit of time to fuck around. From the people milling about, we hear that Esau's wife and child died a couple of years ago, and that's why he adventures so much in hopes of getting them back somehow. At the house on the right is a beast training school, where you can leave behind one of your recruited demons in hopes of strengthening them. If successful, you can expect a better demon, naturally with higher stats. If it fails, well, they run away from the school. Kinda reminds me of the daycare centers from Pokemon. After you finish looking around, Esau will rejoin you at the big building at the far end of the settlement. He urged us to head to a place called Ebla Castle if we'd like to find Soleon, which is to the west of here. Follow the fields, wrap around some mountains, and there it is, Ebla, the biggest city on the entire continent. There's a whole lot of stuff we can do in the big city. 
In terms of rumors, for one thing, we can learn about a village called Sipar to the south that's afflicted by a devastating paralysis sickness. We can also grab an important item. In a rather unassuming house lives an old man with a grandson who wants to learn about beasts. He gives us a notebook to use during our travels so that we can do the same. The notebook is essentially an analysis function that you might see in your average mainline SMT or Persona game. It allows you to view stats and move lists for encountered demons. Pretty neat and easy to miss if you're just blowing your way through the main story and ignoring the houses. Just to the north of this place is a flower garden where Crow and Zodia can be found. Apparently, the plants here are drying up. The two want to stop the suffering of plants all across the world and ask us if we know anything about a lake with the power of the aqua element. Esau seems to know what this is, but the conversation doesn't go much further than that. We'll learn more about all this in a bit. First, let's finish up our business in the city. It's worth visiting the castle for a bit of extra dialogue if you're interested. Essentially, people are nice here. It's not full of backwater racists like Ayn was, and generally, everyone including the king wants to create a world where beasts and humans live together. Nice. Okay, that about wraps it up. Make a quick jaunt back to Esau's base, and his men mention that the aqua we're looking for can be found in an underground arbor. They offer us a key that'll be useful for reaching this area, and with that, Crow and Zodia join up with us, eager to do their part to save nature. Crow is a magic user, and Zodia is another physical attacker. Be sure to equip them with the best shit you can afford. They kinda roll up in your party with dookie ass setups, and they can honestly hold you back a bit, considering they take up spaces in your party that would otherwise be occupied by demons. Slightly to the west of Esau's base, or to the east of Ebla, is a cave with a single locked door in it. Throw in the key we just got, and we come out in a fresh zone with a few points of interest. The entrance immediately to the north takes us to a monster trap where if you have magnetite, you can plop some down, wait around for a while, and if you're lucky, a free demon will be yours to recruit when you get back. It's kind of a pointless little gimmick if I'm being honest, because you can just as easily negotiate with a demon if you're desperate for more party members, but hey, it adds a bit more flavor to the world at least. To the west is an entrance to the depths. This is our next dungeon. It's another incredibly simple layout, though the place is bursting out the ass with treasure more beast bones, a new shield, some money, and some stat boosting items. Reach the lake at the core of the depths, and Kral utters some magic words and receives the aqua. I'm assuming it's some kind of crystal. Anyway, if we're lucky, this will take care of the dried up trees. Nah, actually, this shit doesn't work at all. So much for that. Exasperated, Kral and Zodia stay in our party. Now, on your way out of the city, you'll notice a big group around the castle. Inside, the king is losing his shit because he thinks some of his spies may have been captured in the nearby village of Manes. He hires us to check in on them. Fuck it, why not? We do have a few other places on the list, but nothing wrong with a little tactical espionage action first, right? Manes is south, then to the west, then all the way back north from Ebla. There's a little cave nearby where if you've got some magnetite, you can trade for items. There's no sign of those spies anywhere, but we do hear about the poor working conditions that ordinary citizens working for Magoku are subject to on a nearby island. Sounds like they're up to something big, and they need all the workers they can get. Seems like a place for a spy to go, and fortunately, they're looking for more help. Shit, a free job with no identification or drug test required? Fuck the adventure, let's just quit here and save up for retirement. After signing up, we get hauled off to the island. It's a real shithole of a cave, filled with people who are feeling under the weather. After some investigation, the truth comes out. People here are using metal mine from Sipar, that town with the paralysis sickness we heard about from before, and using it to construct strange figures from a Goku. So like, it's a big ass slave mining operation, and people are inhaling toxic chemicals. Something like that. In one room of this place, you can find a sampling of the work Magoku has accomplished. A small line of these statues, known as Grand Marm, according to a nearby soldier. Nobody here knows what they even do, 
so it must be some big secret reserved for the top brass. In the furthest reaches of this cave, we find the two spies who complain about the place's toxic air. One stands next to a particularly dangerous alloy, which apparently turns people's skeletons to mush. That would explain the paralysis in Sipar. The spies urge us to inform the king about Magoku's fucked up plan, and on the way out, we're forced to take down a soldier who refuses to let us leave. He is capable of using magic on you, but since there's only one, it's not a very hard fight. You'll take moderate damage at most before he falls. Back at the city, we continue our little investigation of this matter at the king's request. This time, he wants us to head further south to Sipar itself and see if we can learn anything else. By the time this shit's all over, the king is probably going to owe me a few million dollars in medical damages because of all the toxic air he's making us breathe. Follow the mountain south, pass through another cave, and when you emerge, you'll see Sipar nestled comfortably in a rocky area. If you thought things were bad in Manaze, you haven't seen anything yet. This depressing little village is just filled with sick people. Even the kids are feeling like total ass. We gotta shut this mining operation down for good. Thankfully, we don't have to go very far to find the place. Yet another soldier blocks our path at the mines. This is like the 700th time we've fought this exact battle. At the back of the mine you find a pile of Becquerel rocks, and you confirm in person, just in case the village full of diseased people wasn't enough, that the air is indeed toxic. I wonder if the protagonist really took the time to breathe in those tasty fumes. You'd have to be fucked in the head to get me to come down into this mine in the first place. Well, the uh, lone soldier guarding the cave is now dead. Good work. The king says that only the Magareth can cure the sick, and asks us if we're going to Bolton to find them. Who the fuck? I mean, clearly we have to say yes in order for the game to continue, so yeah, I guess we are. I guess we'll find out what the hell he's talking about when we get there. There's a ship headed straight there from Sedone that I mentioned earlier. Hop on, and what do you know, it's another shithole. Literally, the place has been torn apart. Apparently, the damages are from a girl who was, quote, causing a scene. Yeah, I'll say. Sounds like they're talking about Sophia. It seems like she's been locked up in a tower outside the town. We'll go break her out in a bit. Let's poke around for a second. So, we learn that the temple in this town is run by the aforementioned Magreth, who are a team of Gaia researchers. Nice. Let them know about the situation in Sipar, and they immediately know that only Medoc would be the kind of guy to have a poison slave mine. One of them heads off to figure things out, and we're momentarily free of our royal assignments. In the back of the lab, you can uncover more of Medoc's plan. A book details a process in which bones of beasts are removed, then sealed into those statue things with Becquerel mine from the earth. Then, the power of Aqua grants the statues new flesh, and the result is what they call a demon. Admittedly, I've been saying demon instead of the proper term beast for like half this video, but it's the same deal. These ones just can't be reasoned with. And, well, they're disgusting flesh golems. In a room on the left, a guy blocks the way, but tells us about how Medoc came back to Magoku 15 years ago, after he was kicked out for some reason. I wonder if it had anything to do with the mass slaughter of countless infants. Well, that's about all the lab has in store for us at the moment. As we reach the door to go back outside, a guy busts it down with freshly shat pants. Sophia has escaped her imprisonment. Damn, she did the fun part for us. Let's go see if we can catch her before she gets too far. The tower is literally pissing distance from the town, so take two steps and we're in. I don't know how this series manages to make grand towers of imprisonment boring, but it's pretty good at it. Look, these games don't have to have elaborate dungeons if they don't want to, but then they should compensate for that somehow. I don't know, more story, a simple puzzle or two, something like that. I feel like I've been beating a dead horse just saying finish the dungeon, get the treasure, but man, that's just all there is. It's a couple branching paths with some treasure and a demon bone you can collect. I don't know about you, but I want to be fucked with. I want this dungeon to warp me around the place, poison me, slap my ass a little bit. I'm a guy that needs stimulation, and if I have to write about one more overly simple dungeon, I might just cry a little. If you think this rant's coming out of nowhere, that's just because it's been bubbling up for the past hour, and I finally had to tell someone. Thanks for listening. 
At the top, Sophia runs into us, blowing past our party straight towards the stairs. So much for climbing those two boring floors. One of the oldsters from town stops her and says that she's too strong to go running around outside, but she just ignores him and leaves. Well, you can grab a few extra bonus treasures if you continue upstairs, and the healing pixie's here for some reason too. Don't mind if I do. Backtrack to the bottom, and there's a whole ass intervention going on. One of Magoku's Gaia soldiers are here, a guy named Gonzu. He gets pissed off that we won't just stay in the tower, and then suddenly the screen starts shaking, and he just leaves. The hell is all that about? Magoku's soldiers wouldn't just be here for nothing. Back at town, that book we are reading about constructing demons, titled The Book of Ball, has been stolen. Now, Medoc has even more fucked up knowledge about the creation of life at his disposal. Kind of a clever little reference to the events of the first game. Fortunately, the Book of Belial is safe. Determined to help make things right, Sophia forces herself into the party, eager to shock everyone with how capable she actually is. Alright, well, she can learn the fusion spell after gaining a few levels, so once you got that, there's nothing to stop you from immediately having a stronger team once you've done a bit of recruiting in any given area. Our next stop is to head to Magoku itself. The researchers give us the ability to teleport there, so all we gotta do is stroll in and take care of business. Briefly, a few of Esau's men stop in and let him know that someone in a place called Saroon is looking for Blantica. He gets so excited that he leaves the party to head straight there. No worries, I kinda prefer working with beasts anyway. So, we can head there after him, but I thought it'd be more interesting to tackle Magoku first, so let's do that. Actually, as soon as you walk in, you lose even more party members. Krau and Zodia rush off to find this town's giant tree, hoping to see what kind of state it's in. Now, it's just Yuri and the new girl he can barely make eye contact with. The people here are actually pretty chill. Magoku is like the epicenter of evil, right? Medoc's base of operations, the place where the king decided to murder children all those years ago. This is ground zero, but it's not that dangerous at all. I mean, I guess there's no reason for the soldiers to rush out and kill us since, well, we tend not to leave any witnesses alive, but I imagined more death spikes and lava pits. Gathering rumors as usual, we can learn that others here have met Soleon, and that the king is still afraid of Gryas to this day. Apparently, one child survived his slaughter. Yeah, figured that out about as soon as I turned the game on. Funnily enough, you can just stroll into the castle from the start of the game. It's pretty goofy that someone who fears being murdered by an ancient demon king just leaves his doors unlocked. Even his men are convinced they're royally fucked once Gryas arrives. I mean, maybe you could start by guarding the place instead of standing around in the break room. In a room where Gonzu hangs out with his squad, one soldier seems excited that our old buddy Larsa is going to kill Medoc. You know, the guy they work for. This whole place is fucking hilarious. The townspeople and even the guards hate the ones in charge, meaning those soldiers we fought earlier must be strict loyalists, or maybe just forced to fight under threat of death. It really felt like the game was hyping up this dangerous, brutal kingdom as the ultimate enemy, with Medoc pulling the strings, but as we can see, his influence doesn't quite extend as far as he wants you to believe. Why don't they all just gang up on him instead of allowing him to build a demon army fueled by slave labor? I guarantee you everyone in the castle could take him. Guess there wouldn't be much of a game in that case though. Anyway, Gonzu doesn't have much to say himself, but we can roll up on Larsa at the very top of the castle. He's upset that Medoc isn't here, and yeah, even the king is absent from his throne room. At least until they both suddenly warp in when we're leaving. They don't even pay attention to us at first, and head straight into the king's private room. Follow them in, and well, here they are. Sophia confronts Medoc about the Book of Baal, and demands he give us back Soleon too. He insists both are necessary to defeat Gryas, and, growing impatient, the king has us locked up in the dungeon. We sit in our cell for maybe one second before Gonzu lets us free. I guess locking up random innocent people was the straw on the camel's back that inspired him to truly switch sides? The other guy he lets free is some old man who says that 15 years ago, 
two children actually escaped from the King's Death campaign. We know one's me, but... Hmm... Who could the other be? Could it be the one other hero in this game that shares our birthday and is going on a parallel adventure to ours? Probably, but let's just play along and pretend we don't know that yet for now. Pass through a quick underground cave segment, and we're free. That's gotta be record time for the fastest, most uneventful jailbreak ever. Well, we're about to be a bit over halfway through the game. Don't worry, the last few parts of the game fly by and are a tad more interesting than the rest. So we gotta track down Esau now. The town he went to, Saroon, can be visited easily by just going to the Sedon Harbor and taking a ship. It seems the talk of the town is a tower to the south that only appears when the moon is full. Additionally, Esau was here earlier, but has since moved on. Following our only lead, we pace around in an area to the south slaying beasts until the moon is full. And sure as shit, there's the dungeon. Now you're not gonna believe this shit. I don't have to fucking complain here. It's different for once. Yeah, there's a handful of warp points around the place, including some that drop you back at the entrance. Now that's what I'm talking about. The top of the dungeon has a boss, Bolvo, this uh, naked fairy that likes strong men. She can take quite the beating and is immune to the Geo line of spells, aka electricity. Depending on when and how you do this quest, Esau will actually show up to the fight and help you, but it didn't happen for me, which I actually kind of liked. I mean, even some slightly different quest outcomes is much appreciated in a little game like this. I think to make him show up, you just have to chat up everyone in town and then come straight here, so I must have missed an NPC somewhere. Not a big deal though, because the fight is perfectly manageable without him. With this little arc taken care of and Esau still MIA, we can head back to Ebla and report all the stuff we've been up to to the king. If you don't want to look for the tower, I think you can just skip it and only do the Magoku prison stuff, but I figured it was worth showing because it's finally a dungeon that isn't totally empty. Back at the castle, surprise, everyone's gone. For some reason, the one guy left says they've all gone to Bolton. The Bolton temple has been turned into a miniature base of sorts, where the king and his men explain that Magoku is going to mount an invasion on a town called Hypatia. He asks if we'll check things out, and also drop by their army's fortified base. Apparently, Soleon is being held captive there, and maybe we can find that missing book too. Well, this is the chance we've been waiting for. The king says we can get to Hypatia by boarding a ship from Sidon and sailing to Tyros. You got it. Before setting sail, I did construct an evil death golem of my own. With my freshly gathered Kirin bones, I made this cool demon that carried me pretty efficiently for a while. Afterwards, a hop and a skip through Sidon, and we're in Tyros. Aside from a brief run-in with Media, there's not really much here. You can find out from one of Esau's guys here that he's in a nearby town called Lycon, and Gonzu is here flirting with some random chick in the flower garden. Lycon is to the northwest through a little mountain range. Guess what? The dude just left. Fuck me, man. Aside from learning that, there's one other thing to check out. These kids are playing in the town square, singing a pretty weird song that ends up being relevant later. Alpha and Omega meet at Dolmen. Omega drank the Lette and forgot about Alpha. The four of them are friends, they all come together to dance. Some pretty cryptic shit, but don't worry, they spell it out for us later. For now, try and piece together what that might mean. So from what we can gather, Esau is in a cave or some shit, I don't know, where isn't this guy supposed to be? There's a clearly visible cave to the east, but there's also an invisible one you can find if you just wander around in the land to the west, where you can find a handful of goodies, chief amongst them a beast egg that's worth checking out before you head in. Esau is poking around in here because he wants gold to finance building a ship. He decides to team up with us so we can help him out. Whatever you say, just don't leave again. I'm not gonna go around the world again looking for you. Oddly enough, this cave reminds me of the penultimate dungeon from the first last bible, Luciferium. It's a series of pathways going up with treasure along the way. The only difference here is that the treasure chests are screaming bloody murder. 
The boss is this monster at the top who's keeping watch over all the gold, and has locked up some innocent people along the way, hence those, uh, screaming boxes. Yeah, they're inside the treasure chests. Most magic doesn't hurt this guy unless it's the Agi spells, so it's more of a physical focused fight. Despite being a rock, just beating on him with swords works fine, so go at it, and he'll fall before long. He drops a gold nugget, which Esau nabs, and then leaves. Again. Listen, we could've just bought the ship with you. I swear to god. Alright, we kinda got sidetracked with his ass again, though it was necessary, because a port that was previously closed back in Tyros is now open. You get dropped off at another port, complete with even more ships that can take you to other places, but our goal for now is still Hypatia to the north. Navigate the windy path, cross some bridges, and there it is. Yeah. Everyone's dead. Fuck. Looks like Magoku beat us here. In the castle, you can find the king sprawled out on the floor, who tells us to visit a nearby fortress and reclaim a stolen dragon egg. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. The last thing Medoc needs is a big-ass dragon to compensate for his limp wizard dick. Be sure to loot the castle, just step over the wounded and take their shit, it's all good. The fortress is a ways away. It's far enough that the devs thought it necessary to place a random lone inn on the path of the place. You gotta venture to the north through a region filled with difficult enemies, then through a cave with a beefy boss at the end. The inn is a pretty sick spot to grind in if you haven't done so in a while. If you happen to die, you can just respawn right there, so if you don't care about losing half your money each time, you can literally just run around autoing battles until you die, until you reach the level you want. It's a little cheesy, but why not? A few extra levels never hurt anyone. So, just a few steps through this cave after the inn, and you're in a prison filled with beasts. One says that Soleon has been calling our name the whole time she's been here. As we reach her cell, Larsa stands over her. It's too late. Soleon's last words have her reminiscing over our childhood, as she remembers the day she took Larsa and us away from Magoku. Yep, the second child that escaped being killed back in the day was Larsa. The last thing she says kinda hits hard for some reason. Her sprite just disappears and the text box says, there's no one to blame for this, it's just fate. Damn. After this, we get a quick flashback of our childhood spent with Larsa. We get into a little disagreement playing out in the fields, but Soleon reminds us to play nice. It's a pretty sweet little scene. Larsa's distraught and says what I believe are the first swear words I've ever seen in a Game Boy game as he vows revenge against humankind. He vows to use his powerful guy to change the world. Well, nothing good came of that in the last game, but hey, go off I guess. In the next room over after Larsa's rant, we've got the boss, two Gozuki demons. They can actually clap some cheek, but they're pretty fragile. Just quickly out damage them and you should be okay. I wouldn't even waste time with buffs or anything like that if you can help it. Just go all out for a couple of turns and get it over with as soon as possible. As they fall, Medoc screams shit and calls his demons useless trash. I guess we're getting to the edgy portion of the story now. He quickly raises two more demons, a couple of Mezukis, and makes his escape. It's kind of the same deal as before. They hit hard, but don't have much endurance. The Agirama spell that Yuri learns is pretty solid for this fight if you throw in a couple points towards your magic stat by now. It was doing over 150 per hit for me, and it was enough to end the battle in like 3 or 4 turns. Medoc's naturally gone by now, but you can find the dragon egg that Dying King was talking about, and a few spies from Ebla mention that some arena battles are taking place in the town of Goku. Come on, Goku? Is it the fucking Tenkaichi Budokai? Whatever. It's the only lead we've got, so it's what we're gonna do. Drag your ass all the way back to the port before Hypatia, hop on a ship, and the globe-trotting goose chase for Medoc continues. In one of these houses, be sure to talk to the arena receptionist handing out tickets. Also, don't miss Media, who's still lurking around waiting for Larsa to give up his violent worldwide conquest for power. Finally, Gonzu is still trying to get his dick wet, and is considering quitting the army. Nice. The arena actually isn't even fucking here, and it turns out, we have to scale Salem Plateau to the north. 
they really had to put this shit on top of a mountain. When you get there, everything is burnt down, and there's half-dead people lying around along with some, uh, fully dead skeletons. This is starting to become a trend. While this place is clearly no longer an arena in the traditional sense, it does have like 3 million encounters per second, so you'll be doing plenty of fighting. Get further into the place, and you run across the Magoku King and Medok up on a balcony, shocked that anyone here is still alive. Medok decides to throw out a few demons at us to clean up the mess he left behind, so let's show him what's up. This time, we're up against a couple of big ogre guys. They favor using ice spells, so hitting back with fire is a good way to deal some damage. These guys can inflict you with Mute, which stops you from casting spells, but fortunately, hitting them with a big stick is also an effective strategy. Hopefully by now your dragon egg is hatched. The creature that comes out, Tiny Gon, was a favorite of mine as he boasts high health and decent damage output. Before long, you'll emerge victorious. You might have thought this was going to be some kind of boss gauntlet, but it isn't. Medoc says the exact same line verbatim that he said last time we beat him, and then leaves. I sure hope we can catch this asswipe soon. Stopping for a rest back in Goku, we hear about a village called Eridu to the south where everyone vanished. Head to the port, hop on the ship headed for the place, and well, there are some people here, but apparently a bunch of kids went down to a nearby forest and never came back. The place is filled with decaying trees, and there's even a small abandoned settlement down here. Krowl stands waiting in front of a well, letting us know that all the kids are down in the bottom. This literally looks like a murder setup, like I'm gonna peek over the edge of this well and she's gonna club me in the back of the head. Fortunately, she's not gonna murder us, but according to Zodia who stands guarding the children at the bottom, something down here has been waiting for us. How ominous. The well then stretches out into a big ass cave with one hell of a boss at the end. It's a manifestation of Gaia itself, gone mad with the desire to absorb more power. Wow, just lurking down here, leeching off the earth in some unassuming hole in the ground? Kinda creepy, but hopefully beating it saves the trees and some of this messed up world's problems resolve themselves. Gaia's got some challenge, I'll give it that. Most magic is ineffective towards it, which makes sense considering it is magic so you'll likely find yourself relying on physical damage here. You've got a pretty sizable pool of health to burn through, so be sure you've got as much MP for healing as possible for the fight, as you'll have to withstand attacks that hurt the entire group while you're wearing it down. All the while, you're just being stared at by this hammy face that looks like it wants to drop the world's biggest shit. This might seem like a final boss or something, but we've still got a bit longer to go before that. Once you've beaten down Gaia, it says the usual things that primordial evil beings say when they die in these games, and reminds us that it'll always be back, yada yada yada. Krau has the realization that none of the world's problems have anything to do with the Beast King Gryas, and that actually it's just this corrupt energy permeating the planet. Maybe we should tell Medoc that so I don't have to chase him down anymore. Very casually, Krowl says she's gonna head home to Blantica and see if she can learn anything else. You know, Blantica, the lost legendary city of granted wishes, the whole reason Esau is alive. Yeah, I guess she lives there. That would have been nice to know like four fucking hours ago. Climb out of the well, then warp to a city close to Esau's place and head on over there. Sophia and I explain the situation to him and he's super excited. Except, we didn't follow Krau home, so we still don't know where it is. You know, we're pretty stupid. On the bright side, Esau's ship is ready, so at least we can hit the high seas and potentially find the place faster. On the way out, if you stop by the Beast School, you can grab a couple of free demons for the journey. Cerberus and Orthrus. Nice to see some familiar faces from the other games. With most of the overworld now at our fingertips, we're rapidly approaching the endgame. Kinda like in the first last survival, you'll notice as you sail around the world that it isn't all that big. You'll just want to search around for unfamiliar land. There's quite a few places to find, and I'll talk about most of them, but as a good place to start, you'll want to find Bolton and then sail south from there. 
you'll come across a place simply called Small Village, where a shop sells a weapon called the Star Knuckles. Some of the villagers mention them. It's not just a little suggestion for new equipment, you're actually going to need them at one point to progress, so be sure you just scratch this off the list as soon as possible. One guy also mentions a girl with a flying ship. Yeah, we still got an airship to get, and it's pretty strange that it comes immediately after finding the normal ship. Most games kind of pace the vehicles out, like sailing is for mid-game and flying is for late-game, but nah, this time we'll just get one right after the other. Apparently, this ship can be found far to the south near a place called Salma. Sailing south and a bit to the east, you can come across a pretty fucking wild location with a huge reference to the first game before you reach Salma. Check this out. It's an island with two caves. One is the Agasha Grotto. There's a big boulder blocking the way, so just go up and smash it. A friendly beast says only someone with a strong guy can do so, so I'm not sure if it's tied to your level, or if you have the star knuckles yet, but it broke for me. Behind it is a room with a couple of books. These two comprise the Book of Gryas. They seem to be written from the perspective of Gryas himself, as he explains that the beasts are no different than humans and deserve to be defended. Something known as the Black Gaia has been behind the scenes of all human and beast conflict over the years, including those on the fifth planet, which are the events of Last Bible 1. So, it must be something that even the universal will couldn't detect. A sort of corruption inherent within the energy of the universe itself. Something like that. We've already fought something known as Gaia earlier, so that must have been a nascent form of something far more destructive. The other cave is none other than fucking Luciferium. I'm pretty sure it's intended to be the exact same place as the first game. Remember, the place Lucifer and the Gaia Masters fled to in that game was this planet, before anything had settled on it. Thousands of years later, it was the home of King Gryas, and now it's just a random cave with some beasts in it. One pixie in here tells us that Larsa had been here recently, and there's some treasure we can pick up. Nice. You know, this little bit isn't much, but I'm a sucker for some loose connections between games, so I thought it was pretty neat especially because it's relatively subtle. Alright, just a bit further south and we reach Salmatia. Guess the guy that told us about Salma couldn't remember the proper name. There are more rumors of an airship to the south, but the path out of town is blocked. An old lady in one of the houses recognizes Sophia, commenting on how she's grown up. She must have some history with the place. Another lady says our asses aren't allowed to go south. A powerful spell called Ron Kane is sealed there, and that's too dangerous to learn. The fuck? We're gonna need that shit, Granny. She randomly tells us to go to Goku, so... okay. Gonzu, still flirting with the locals, asks if our friend Media was Larsa's girlfriend. What do you mean, was? Visit the port, and we find out she's been captured by pirates. How totally random. Why did that magical old woman know this? I guess, if anything, it shows that Larsa has become consumed in his power quest. I mean, you'd think he'd be around trying to save her or something. Whatever. Let's go slap some pirate ass. Gonzu joins up, we hop on our ship, and the pirate fortress is a good 10 feet away from the city on an island. Classic Last Bible. First up, a lookout stops us in our tracks. He's got lightning magic, and can tank a moderate amount of damage. This guy doesn't even look like a pirate, he's clearly a giant pink goblin. Next, after entering the fortress proper, we've got, um, a proper pirate. If you're wondering why I'm not describing the dungeon, just take a guess. You'd have more fun imagining a pirate fortress in your head than actually exploring this one. No puzzles, extremely small, you get the gist. I guess these guys put all their budget into the lookout, because this one goes down so fast it's almost funny. Like he stands up to fight us and just immediately gets his head ripped out of his ass. Finally, we got the chief. Looks like a blue walrus or something. He's capable of using spells and can mute your team, but otherwise it's a simple fight. If he opts to hit you with just a standard physical attack, 
you can usually consider that a wasted turn. It hardly does anything at all. Behind the chief, you can find a pendant, one of those given to us and Larsa by Media at the start of the game to remind us of our friendship. Upstairs, we find Media lying down in her cell. She says that she got kidnapped because she hadn't seen Larsa in so long that she wanted to make him worry about her. Then she stops talking. Is she dead? Did the devs run out of time to make a better way for us to realize that Lars is a bad guy? It just seems so hand-wavy and uninspired. Oh well. In the midst of this emotional moment, Gonzu gets really angry at Larsa and warps out. Back in Goku, we learn that he's been kidnapped by Magoku. Come on, really? I'm about to go fucking insane. I'm seriously gonna rip my dick off and jump rope with it. How many kidnappings and goose chases can this game throw at you? Like, in the span of three fucking seconds, he got kidnapped? Okay, well here we go again. And it's like the same thing we just did, too. Instead of pirates kidnapping someone, it's Magoku. The place you find the kidnapped person is a base on an island by itself that's right next to the city. Is the dungeon good? Well, here's a better question. Are you fucking stupid? Actually, this one's worse than the pirate hideout. Can you believe that? It's worse. It's even smaller. Look at this room. It's like I'm in someone's closet or something. This is the Magoku Super Mega Evil Fortress? You kill the colonel in like three hits, you find Gonzu in a cell. He's so mad he got captured that he challenges you to a 1v1 to prove that he isn't weak. You literally fight him solo in his cell, too. It's not hard at all because you can heal and he can't, so beat his ass a little bit and he's like, well, Larsa's still stronger and he's gonna use that power to form the underworld. How do you even know that, Gonzu? Okay, let's just take a second to calm down. It's almost over. There can't be any more of these random guy leaves your party and you have to go find him and then it happens again gimmicks, right? It's over. Back in Magoku, the castle is filled with demons, and a bunch of soldiers stand around outside talking about it. They're far stronger than anything we've fought in the past few minutes, almost like the game was trying to trick you into letting your guard down by boring you to death. Two Ashagi are your initial obstacle. Hit them with fire, bring them down before they can strike back. At the very least, if you die here, you're literally in the town. Then, when you hit the throne room, you see Medoc can get mauled to death by two of his own demons. He's dead dead too. You don't even get to fight the guy who's been bothering you the entire game. It would have cost the devs zero dollars to have a cool cheesy climactic fight with Medoc in the throne room, and they made him die in a cutscene that lasts three seconds. God, I guess I should have expected as much. So yeah, the only villain we've really seen at this point in the game is dead. Congrats guys, we did it. Now, as soon as I can find the address of the evil cosmic energy behind all this, we'll be done. The demons that killed Medoc are even stronger than the ones downstairs. Don't bother with the buffing setup, just go fast, bring them down ASAP. It's one of those big nasty slap fights to the death. The king lays dying and Larsa stands over him. He thinks the murderous demons are a perfect reflection of true human nature and pities the world he lives in. He lights the Book of Ball on fire and vows to gather the world's hatred to create a new one. Alrighty. Outside, they make Gonzu the king of Magoku because he's pretty cool, I guess. I'm not even kidding. If we want to stop Larsa's underworld project, we gotta know where it is. Thankfully, if you sleep in an inn, you'll have a dream in which he reveals its precise location. It's pretty funny and unnaturally spoken. Like, yeah. Hell is gonna be right here to the west of Detroit. Come on by when you have the chance. Anyway, it's southeast of Salmatia. As you arrive, you'll find a tower that has a suspiciously boat-shaped interior. It's filled with beasts who explain that, surprise surprise, it is a ship, and it needs a lapis to be able to fly. Just like the first game. You can also find the sealed spell Roncane now, as the southern exit of the town has been opened. The old lady waits to give it to us, also blessing us with some miscellaneous items, including one that boosts all of your stats. Finding the Lapis just comes down to searching for more unvisited land. It's in a cave on an island near the small village. 
You definitely need the Star Knuckles for this part. Crack open the boulder hovering in an underground lake, and bam, there's the stone we need. Bring it back to the airship, and shit yeah, we can fly. Even if it doesn't seem very exciting, I'm sure you'll be happy at the fact that random encounters on the overworld are essentially gone now. Thank god. You'll want to start making your final preparations now. Search for any and all islands that are inaccessible by boat. It's gonna be the ones that have really high borders. Powerful armor, weapons, a monster egg that hatches a sphinx, and more are all waiting to be found and make the final encounter much easier. One of these spots is a completely blank island that can only be reached by flying. There's a secret cave here, so be sure you're looking carefully for any spots you can land on across the world and check them out. Near the airship tower, finally, is Blantica, which is high above everything else. It looks like any other town, but Esau is hyped to finally be here. In the temple, he begs the wise men to revive his family, but they just won't do it. It's against the ways of life and all that. Defying fate is something they will not participate in. Esau calls what they say, quote, sanctimonious bullshit, and runs off. Man. Crow and Zodio chilling out here too, discussing with the sages how to combat the approaching Black Gaia. They explain that it is the tainted essence of Gaia, made corrupt by this world's sorrow and pain. Whereas Larsa just wants to do away with everything and start over because of this, maybe we can just beat the thing back and keep our world. In a room behind Zodia, strangely, you can find several other people identical to him. A couple of sages reveal that they're called Dew, and are soulless husks that follow only their master's orders. Zodia is unique among them, and shows Crow as his own master. Huh, alright. Stay in an inn in Blantica, and you have a vision of a tower appearing just at the base of the massive landmass that it sits at the top of. It's Larsa. The entrance to the underworld has appeared, and he's ready to swallow the world whole. Let's check it out. Consider this our first little excursion into hell. The encounters are appropriate for the name. You want to be at your best shape in here. Take the time to fuse solid demons, equip them with armor if you can, and of course, venture around to the shops and get the best stuff for the rest of your party. Kral, Zodia, and Esau will soon be coming, so remember to have enough money saved to take care of that. The shit you can find laying around in caves is great, but it's not quite enough to protect everyone, so a bit of shopping is going to be necessary. The first part of the underworld is just a cave. Figures. It does improve later, so let's get the boring part out of the way. Larsa is standing at the end and pulls a Gonzu on us, challenging us to a 1v1 fight. He doesn't quite live up to the rumors, it's just a simple battle, he will never out damage you, and if the damage starts to add up, well, just throw out a healing spell and it should be over quick. As he falls, he seems regretful of the fact that he wasn't the reincarnation of Gryas. This entire time, he thought it was his destiny to be the King of the Beasts who starts a new world from scratch, but now, Larsa realizes that it's us. And not only that, he realizes now that Gryas was actually not someone to be feared, and that Medoc's worries were for nothing. He was actually a chill guy that was in tune with nature. Before we leave, we can pick up another friendship pendant, as well as El's Rod. El is actually the canon name of the first Last Bible protagonist. Pretty cool, honestly. Our boy found a way to help us out thousands of years later. Sophia seems to remember this thing, too. Back at Blantica, even Crow remembers it, but they don't know from where. As they focus for a minute, they suddenly realize that they were all friends in a past life, and so, we decide to gather up the others and share the news. Before we can leave, a sage tells us that the revival of Gryas has actually been hidden in a song. You remember that shit, right? Yeah, the song those kids were singing. We'll get back to that in a second. So, Gonzu remembers the staff, and suddenly remembers being killed by the Black Gaia. He knows his mission all those years ago was to defend the entire planet against evil, and joins back up with us. Esau explains some of the meaning of the song to us when we arrive. Let's recap what that was for everyone sitting in the back. Alpha and Omega meet at Dolmen. 
Omega drank the latte and forgot about the Alpha. The four of them are friends, they all come together to dance. Now you get it? The four are Sophia, Zodia, Gonzu, and Krau. We forgot our past, and as Esau says, the dolmen mentioned in the song is a place surrounded by stones. Seek the stones then, or wherever that might be. Well, in an area close to where the game starts, at Yuri's little forest, there it is. A big island surrounded by rocks, with a clearing in the middle of a stone formation. We all gather around, and Yuri officially remembers that he's King Gryas. The entire party learns the Force ability, and the voice of Ancient Gryas tells us to follow the advice of the trees. Back at Esau's base, we have a surprisingly tender little moment. The tree says that life is not infinite, but that's what makes it so precious. It then tells us to let Esau know that his wife and child will always be watching over him. He heads outside and for one final time sees his family as they encourage him to press onward. Despite not being one of the original heroes from back in the day, Esau too learns the ability of force and joins us in our quest to finish off Black Gaia once and for all. Let's go back to the underworld and close that shit up. There's like one final thing you can do before this if you don't feel ready. If you got all three friendship pendants, you can give them to a guy forging a legendary blade in the town of Tyros, and he'll give you the Force Sword. The second half of the underworld is much harder. You got a handful of teleports to mess around with, and obviously, some of the game's toughest enemies. I'd suggest stocking up on MP restoratives. It'd suck to fight through all of this only to reach the final boss and run out of magic halfway through its fight. You'll know you're near the end when you reach a big path lined with boulders. At the end, a voice laments the past 2,000 years it's spent in sorrow and pain. Not wasting time with any further words, it appears. Gaia. Finally. Kinda like the Universal Will from Last Bible 1, this fight feels like the first that you actually might break a sweat during. Gaia's a heavy hitter, and a lot of attacks just barely scratch its massive health bar. The key to winning is to use the force ability granted to each of your party members. Force requires two party members to cast it in the same turn before it deals damage, and it can only be used once by the party per turn. So, have two people prepare the spell, and have the others focus on keeping them alive. When, or if, they run out of MP, switch their roles off to someone else. Even if your party starts to crumble, hang in there. You only technically need two alive to finish the game. Keep at it, be patient, and eventually, Gaia will fade away. Just like that, and well, the game's over. You get some brief shots of each party member off living their own lives, and that's it. Not much of an ending, but a happy one nonetheless. As the credits end, you'll notice you can keep playing the game. There's actually some post-game shit you can do, like return to Luciferium and recruit Lucifer himself. You can grab some other big names too, like Michael and Gabriel, so if you're crazy enough to keep playing this game after it's over, go for it. As for me, I'm good. While Last Bible 2 is a pretty fun little game that offers remarkable improvements in combat and demon interaction over its predecessor, it also has a pretty damn repetitive world and story structure, which, though it can be kinda endearing and relaxing in small bursts, becomes annoying if you play the game for longer than like 20 minutes at a time. I guess that makes it well suited to the Game Boy. The mechanical upgrades are immediately noticeable if you're coming straight from the first game, but the excitement wears off the further you get into the story. Like the first Last Bible, it's another mixed bag. There's some innovation here, but it can be hard to appreciate unless you're really into Megami Tensei, or you just really like generic fantasy RPGs. Ultimately, while I like it better than the first Last Bible, I wouldn't rank it that much higher. I'd give this one a D plus rather than just a flat D ranking. Alright. That's two down. Just one more in the main trilogy. But first, we have side games to get through. Yeah, you didn't think the pain would stop that quickly, right? And believe me, it only gets worse from here. Way, way worse.